how constitutional protection for journalists' anonymous sources was both denied and created in 1972. Let's consider a question that the United States Supreme Court has uh, considered only one time in its history. Does the First Amendment protect members of the press from testifying in court when they say they are protecting the identities of anonymous sources uh, whose identities they have promised not to reveal? Yes or no? Um, it is an important constitutional question to consider for a number of reasons. To begin with, which approach would be more beneficial to a democratic, uh, open democratic society based on an informed citizenry making the best decisions in a free marketplace of ideas? Uh, which approach would be most likely to produce the most information uh, useful to such a society? Uh, will more information be obtained by forcing journalists, members of the press, to testify in court when law enforcement officials believe the press has information that may advance the course of, of justice? Or will more such information be provided by the other approach, by providing a privilege that would allow members of the press not to testify in order to protect an anonymous source uh, on the theory that such sources will not provide useful information uh, to the public through the press unless they are protected. Now in most cases citizens are indeed required by force of law to testify when they have information uh, that is thought to be useful to advancing the course of justice. Um, however, the sort of privilege not to do that does exist uh, in some contexts in our legal system. Doctors, for example, generally um, are granted such a privilege to protect the confidentiality of doctor-patient uh, discussions. Lawyers also generally are granted such a privilege to protect the confidentiality of lawyer-client discussions. And many journalists, although it should be emphasized not all, argue that they, they too should have such a privilege and that it should be grounded in the protections established um, uh, in the First Amendment uh, protecting freedom of the press. So that's the central argument that was put before the Supreme Court in Brandsburg v. Hayes, uh, a case decided in 1972. And another very important reason for us to consider uh, the question in this case derives from the unusual manner in which the court ultimately articulated its decision uh, or its answer to the question. Or at least perhaps we should say the manner in which many scholars, um, uh, many legal scholars, many journalists, and indeed many judges believe the court answered the question. Uh, to this day, the debate continues in the courts as to whether the Supreme Court's answer to the question, whether there is a constitutional privilege for reporters to refuse to testify to protect uh, an anonymous source, whether the answer was simply no, strong argument for that, or whether the answer was both no and yes, depending on the facts of the case at hand. The um, latter interpretation derives most centrally from the way in which Justice Lewis F. Powell, Jr. joined the five justice majority in its holding, joined the majority um, but authored a concurring opinion in which he suggested uh, he might well have joined the other side, the four dissenting justices, if um, the facts of the Brandsburg case had been different. Now, on one level, the, court, the answer the court gave to the question, uh, its holding in Brandsburg v. Hayes, is very simple. The case actually involved three cases from the lower courts that had been consolidated at the Supreme Court. But all three involved members of the press who had been called to testify before grand juries uh, investigating criminal matters on which the journalists had reported and had utilized information from um, anonymous sources that they had promised to uh, uh, protect their anonymity. The journalists argue that they should not be required to testify um, to answer the subpoenas because they believed a privilege not to do so uh, was inherent in the pronouncement of the First Amendment that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of the press. So that's their argument. However, the five justices in the majority at the court, the Brandsburg Court, did not provide journalists with the answer they sought. Instead, the majority opinion clearly stated that the First Amendment bestows no such privilege on members of the press. Uh, Justice Byron White, uh, writing for the majority, wrote, and this is a long quote. In fact, it's all one sentence. 
On the records now before us, we perceive no basis for holding that the public interest in law enforcement and in ensuring effective grand jury proceedings is insufficient to override the uh, consequential but uncertain burden on news gathering that is said to result from insisting that reporters, like other citizens, respond to relevant questions put to them in the course of a valid grand jury investigation or criminal trial. Uh, more succinctly, Justice White wrote for the majority, we cannot seriously entertain the notion that the First Amendment protects a newsman's agreement to conceal the criminal conduct of his source or, or evidence thereof on the theory that it's better to write about crime than to do something about it. Uh, the majority declared that the journalists had not shown the court persuasive evidence that whatever burden might be placed upon the press by their ruling, um, by denying the privilege, would be greater than the loss of uh, uh, testimony uh, in grand jury and criminal investigations. The majority emphasized another crucial problem uh, with embracing the arguments of the press, and we're still uh, also considering this uh, element today. Doing so, Justice White, granting the privilege, Justice White noted, would require that the courts define who would and would not receive the privilege. Uh, they would have to define who is and is a member of the, isn't a member of the, the, the press. Uh, he declared that would be a questionable procedure in light of the traditional doctrine that liberty of the press is the right of the lonely pamphleteer who uses carbon paper or a mimeograph just as much as the large metropolitan publisher who utilizes the latest photo composition methods. Uh, further, he said, almost any author may quite accurately assert that he is contributing to the flow of information to the public, that he relies on confidential sources of information, and that those sources will be silenced if forced to make disclosures before a grand jury. <clears throat> so Justice White was saying the court did not want to get into that. Uh, that is not the business of courts. Uh, in that assertion, uh, the majority has proven quite prescient. Um, even though it spoke in an age long before the internet arguably made a journalist of anyone and everyone uh, with access to it. Uh, indeed, although a federal shield law that would protect journalists by statute from revealing anonymous sources uh, does not exist to this day, the Congress has very seriously considered, and actually still is seriously considered, enacting one, and the proposals have had strong support. By most accounts, the single greatest sticking point uh, preventing such legislation from going forward seems to be the debate over who would be covered by a federal shield law. Uh, in effect, who would be considered a member of the press for purposes of these protections, and who isn't? Uh, in an age when anyone can become a blogger um, with internet access that arguably represents a digital press uh, able to reach a worldwide audience, the question has only grown you know, more difficult to answer. Now. Uh, very strong arguments on that side of the question. But four justices dissented uh, rather strongly in the Brandsburg case, uh, with uh, Justice Potter Stewart writing for three of them, um, and, and the fourth writing separately. Justice Stewart wrote, the question whether a reporter has a constitutional right to a confidential relationship with his source is grounded in principles, quote, as basic as any found in the Constitution. So, uh, I, I, Another group of justices saying this is grounded solidly in the Constitution. Not only, Justice Stewart wrote, will this decision impair performance of the press's constitutionally protected functions, but it will, I am convinced in the long run, harm rather than help the administration of justice. Um, again, uh, that view was formally in the minority in regard to the Brandsburg holding, but that brings us to what Justice Stewart called Justice Powell's, quote, enigmatic concurring opinion. Uh, to reemphasize, Justice Powell did join Justice, White, uh, Justice White's majority opinion and its holding that reporters do not have a constitutional privilege uh, to re refuse to testify before grand juries that had subpoenaed them, as they had in Brandsburg. But in his concurring opinion, he wrote that, uh, that he, he said he wrote to emphasize the holdings, quote, limited nature because in his view, uh, it did not go so far as to declare that, quote, newsmen are without constitutional rights with respect to the gathering of news or in the safeguarding of their sources. So Justice Powell says there is something in the Constitution, in his view, and he's writing this in a concurring opinion. He wrote that uh, the asserting claim 
uh, to privilege should be judged on its facts by the striking of proper balance between the freedom of the press and the obligation of all citizens to give relevant testimony with respect to criminal conduct. Um, he said that these should be tried on a case-by-case -case basis. basis. Um, specifically, he declared that journalists would not be without remedy if the information sought had only a remote and tenuous relationship to the investigation, uh, or if the testimony sought would implicate confidential source relationships without a legitimate need of law enforcement. So compare that, uh, co compare the similarity of those key points with the assertions of Justice Stewart in his dissent. Uh, Justice Stewart argued a three-part test for granting a limited privilege, uh, constitutional privilege, that unless government can show a court, one, probable cause exists to believe the reporter has information, quote, clearly relevant to a specific criminal investigation. So again, that's similar to uh, what Justice Powell said in his concurrence. Two, reporter is the only identifiable source of the needed information. And three, again, similar to Justice Powell, there is a compelling and overriding interest in the information. Even at the time, 1972, Justice Stewart wrote in his opinion that Justice Powell's, quote, enigmatic concurring opinion gives some hope of a more flexible view in the future, um, despite the majority outcome that day. And, and indeed, over the 40-some years since the Brandsburg ruling, the lower courts have demonstrated what could be seen as flexibility in their interpretation of it. Uh, the way I often tell my students is we might imagine that the lower courts, some of them, tend to move Justice Powell back and forth between the two groups of justices, between the, the uh, majority of the day and the dissent. Now, I tell them I'm speaking figuratively because Justice Powell died in 1998. He's not literally being moved, but his opinion uh, seems to be read that way by the lower courts. As Judge, um, many of the lower courts, Judges uh, Richard Posner wrote for the Seventh Circuit Federal Court of Appeals in 2012, a large number of cases conclude that there is a reporter's privilege, though they do not agree on its scope. A few cases refuse to recognize the privilege, as the majority did in Brandsburg, um, at least in cases like Brandsburg that involve grand jury inquiries. That is one very clear holding that's held up. Our court, the Seventh Circuit, has not taken sides, he wrote. Um, he noted, however, that some courts have, uh, that have recognized a First Amendment privilege have interpreted Brandsburg as if it didn't exist. Uh, some as if the majority opinion were more of a plurality opinion, which is m roughly the way I tend to uh, um, interpret what the courts are doing, the lower courts. And some have concluded that in fact it did create a reporter's privilege because of Justice Powell's concurrence. There is some good scholarship that has asserted that Justice Powell's papers indicate he fully intended to leave room for a qualified reporter's privilege in Brandsburg with his, uh, quote, as this scholar called it, his cryptic concurrence that spoke louder than the majority. Uh, other research has determined, uh, demonstrated the way that Justice Powell often wrote these concurring opinions, more often than any other justice during his time on the court. And frequently his concurrences had the effect of trumping uh, the majority opinions. Indeed, uh, Brandsburg is just one of six of his concurring opinions that uh, have been uh, documented um, that some lower courts treat as if they are the majority holding. And so common was this practice, his practice of authoring these influential concurrences uh, while providing the swing vote, the technique in the law journals is often called Powelling. <laughs> so um, <laughs> despite the differences in the lower courts to this day, the Supreme Court has never stepped in with a subsequent ruling to uh, clear up the different interpretations in the lower courts uh, regarding the reporter's privilege for protecting anonymous sources. Uh, thus, one might say that even more than four decades after the Brandsburg ruling and more than four, uh, 15 years after Justice Powell's death, um, we still are not certain wh exactly where he uh, or the Brandsburg court came to rest uh, on the question of the reporter's privilege. Thank you. <laughs> Freedom 101 is made possible by generous support from the University of Oklahoma Alumni Association. Freedom 101 is a program of the Institute for the American Constitutional Heritage at the University of Oklahoma. For more videos and podcasts, visit freedom.ou.edu.